retribution for them. Um, there is actually a national organization of African Americans with cystic fibrosis. Um, and in fact, the um, uh, uh, person who started this organization was one of the speakers on that, um, on that symposium one, talking about his interactions and how he was diagnosed in his mid 50s um, and how that affected him and has affected him for the rest of his life. And so I always try to point people to look at this and this um, particular community works very closely with the CF Foundation um, in order to try to highlight the, um, uh, you know, some of the racial injustices not asking, that we have um, uh, seen so far. I'm going to talk about community voice at the end of this, but I think that it's a really important way that we can engage um, to start mediating some of these biases. The next thing I want to um, touch on is gender diversity. Um, I love this picture. This was um, shown, I didn't put up the symposium. That's my mistake. I think I might have it in a later slide. Um, but this um, is the gender unicorn. And this is a graphic created by um, a group called the Trans um, Student Educational Resources. And it's free online. So if you Google that, can you please go ask daddy? Thank you. Please go ask daddy. Sorry, guys. Um, you all are familiar with this, obviously. Um, Zoom days. Um, so they, um, it's an available free online, so anyone can go and download it and they actually say, please use this um, you know, uh, to educate, to um, instruct and, uh, and you know, um, include it in your presentations. So the reason why I love this is because I think it really gives us a great visual on how many different ways um, gender um, is presented or considered in a person. Um, and so somebody who is transgender is somebody who's, um, who's any one of these uh, uh, different fields is, uh, is in contrast to what the gender was that they were assigned at birth. So walking through it, um, your gender identity, meaning do you think, do you identify as a male, a female, or another gender? That's how you feel within. I am a boy, I am a girl. Your gender expression is this little um, curvature over here. How do you present, oops, how do you present yourself to the world? Um, do, you, uh, do you present yourself as a male, as a female, or as a different gender altogether? The sex assigned at birth is, um, is down here. So we do have um, two main sexes, male and female, but there are other or intersex patients. Um, and so that also plays into this. And then there's who you're physically and emotionally attracted to, because those might not be one and the same. Um, and those are represented here by these hearts. Um, and so if any of these are incongruent, you might consider yourself transgender. So this graph um, is, um, uh, is taken from a Gallup poll. Um, and between the years um, 2012 and 2017, they asked the question, do you personally identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender? Um, and here's where people um, were rating themselves. So somewhere around three and a half to 4%. Um, in 2018, they changed the wording. And instead of saying, do you identify personally as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender? They say, which of the following do you consider yourself to be? You can select as many as apply, straight or heterosexual, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And at that point, those people who started um, identifying within the LGBTQ community, you can see it starting to increase over time. So what is the prevalence of gender diverse youth in CF? And so this is um, from Symposium 8. Um, and this was really interesting. In 2017, they did a youth, there was, this is a non-specific to CF, but a youth risk behavior survey that asked, do you identify as transgender? And you were allowed to pick yes, no, or unsure. And so from this, which was done in a, um, in a single community, they estimated that 1.8% of people identified as transgender. And so if you take our average um, uh, 30,000 people in the US with CF, that comes out to be about 540 people with CF would ex be expected to be um, transgender according to this. 
But um, the presenters within the symposium um, did a study where they actually reframed the gender question and they asked about a gender diverse identity instead. So instead of saying, do I identify as transgender, they asked them um, whether or not their um, gender uh, identity differed at all with how they were assigned at birth. Um, and this is actually just very recently published um, earlier this year. And when they reframed it that way, 9.2% of people identified as gender diverse. Um, and again, multiplying by 30,000 people in the US, that gives us um, almost 3,000 people um, with CF who I'd identify as gender diverse. So this is a large portion of our population. Why does it matter? It matters. And this is the statistic that um, really hit home for me, um, is that transgender people um, or gender diverse youth um, have a significantly increased chance of having depression and attempting suicide compared to their cisgender co uh, uh, colleagues. And so you can just look at these numbers. Um, this is, um, this is uh, over here in the blue. These are trans youths who have supportive parents and over here, trans youths with unsupported parents. And so if patients, um, if youth were able to um, share with their parents, they had um, significantly higher life satisfaction, higher self-esteem, higher improved mental health, None had housing problems. Again, these are, these are adolescents and um, children versus 55 of those with unsupportive parents. Depression, much less. Suicide attempts, much, much less. This is important to acknowledge. So again, what can we do? If you're a neutral in the situation of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And so again, know and mediate your biases. One thing that we really want to start working on within the CF community is to ask and not assume. And so if you're coming to see us in clinic, um, hopefully you'll see us start doing this on a more regular basis to not assume that everyone is cisgender, that everyone's gender identity lines up with what they were assigned at birth. Um, and you may see more of us um, introducing ourselves with our pronouns. Um, it's interesting to think that the, um, the, the terminology has actually changed over time um, and that it no longer is called preferred pronouns because preferred does suggest that there is a choice in the matter as opposed to this really being someone's identity. And so now um, I, we are trying to make more of a concerted effort when we're meeting new patients and saying, hi, my name is Jen Growski. My pronouns are she, her. What are yours? And again, we'll touch on community voice in a little bit. All right. So here we are to the part where we're gonna talk about restoring CFTR function. Um, so most of this information came from the plenary sessions as well as symposium four. And let me pause for one second to close that door again. So hopefully the external noise is less. You gotta love those supportive spouses who say, oh yeah, sure, no problem. You can do your presentation, I'll take care of the kids. <laughs> All right, um, so the CFTR uh, pipeline, I think that this is a pretty common um, and familiar thing to many people. Um, we've been talking about this for a number of years. CFTR is the, the protein um, uh, that, is, uh, that forms the channel through which the chloride ions um, travel. Um, and it is the protein that is defective or missing in CF. And, um, and the pipeline are the drugs that have been tested um, or are in the process of being evaluated as treatment for this defective CFTR. And our goal is to restore functioning to the CF protein. And so here in this um, badly copied um, version of the pipeline, um, you can see that as drugs go through testing, there's several phases. There's the preclinical phase, which is where um, laboratory cells, laboratory animals are studied to look for toxicities. 
um, at phase one, phase two, phase three studies, which involve um, increasing numbers of patients, um, at looking at safety, tolerability, efficacy, and then um, randomized control trials before drugs finally get to patients. And so what the CF Foundation does, and you can find this on cff.org, is they demonstrate where all those, uh, these different medications are within the pipeline. Um, and so these have already come to patients. These are names that you might be familiar with. Um, Trikafta has, um, has been uh, you know, the, the hot news of the last two years, um, but before that came Kaleidico or Cambi and Simdico, all of those available to our patient population now. The next group are in early phase testing, which means um, within phase two, it is starting to get to testing um, in patients with CF, not on a large scale yet, but um, uh, uh, moving through this pipeline um, to hopefully um, eventually make it to become available to patients. And we're gonna touch on these again in the next slide. And then finally, you can see the biggest chunk of this pipeline is actually the stuff that's in really um, early phase study in the preclinical studies. But the CF Foundation has made um, a, a big um, financial and intellectual investment in these various companies um, in order to um, uh, promote and encourage them to try to find um, ways to advance, um, uh, advance us to our goal of restoring function to the CF Foundation. So, Stepping back and looking at the timeline, um, drug development is a really slow process, um, but it's actually been um, a pretty rapid um, um, approval uh, timeline for us in CF compared to how long drugs usually take to get approved. And that speaks to just um, how much difference it makes in the lives of so many people. So back in 2012, Adacaftor was first approved um, for patients um, over the age of six, and that was our first really highly effective modulator therapy. Um, for those of you who know patients who were on it back then and um, or who continue to take it this day, it was, it was game changing for a very small percentage of patients, about 4% of the CF population in the U.S. was able, eligible to take Adacaftor. By 2015, um, we got Lumicaftor Ivacaftor um, for age 12 and older, and then Ivacaftor was extended down to the younger years. In 2016, we extended down the Lumicaftor Ivacaftor to age 6 to 11, and so on and so forth. So you can see that the way that we've been uh, proceeding is doing um, early tests primarily in adults. Um, and then moving it younger and younger and younger with the concept being that um, if you can get these drugs into patients earlier, you have a better chance of, um, of uh, stopping permanent damage to the lungs, to the pancreas and to other organs. And so um, here's where we're at now, where we have, we're currently um, enrolled in a study, involved in a study. We're studying Trikafta, this is Alexacafta, Tiscafta, Avacafta, or Trikafta for two to five year olds, and that is currently ongoing. We're also studying Orkambi um, in one to two year olds, and Ivacafta has approved, been approved down to the age of four months. So trying to tie back together um, this drug development pipeline and what we were first talking about and racial um, inequity, um, Dr. Megan McGarry and Symposium Run really um, highlighted this very nicely. Um, if you look over here on the left portion of the graph, this is any CFTR modulator. So all four of those drugs that are currently available, broken down by race, who have mutations that are eligible for particular CFTR modules, mod modulators. So non-Hispanic whites by far, when we say that 90% of people have um, a, a CFTR modulator, modulator available to them, this is the number that, that is being quoted. But you can see that that's actually not true for Black um, or African Americans, for Hispanics, or for other races, um, much lower percentages. And you can see these individual ones um, uh, for each of the individual drugs. So that is one of the examples of the inequities that I was referring to. Now, um, we had a, a label expansion not too long ago, about a year ago for Trikafta. 
Um, and um, this was really interesting because it was a, a pretty uh, unique move at the time for the FDA to approve um, label expansion for drugs um, uh, based on uh, laboratory studies. And so because these mutations are, are pretty rare, it's very, very hard to gather enough patients together to do a trial in them and compare them to other patients. And so, um, so the labs um, that study CFTR in the cells um, were able to test various compounds um, and um, prove that in the lab that the cells responded um, to the treatment. And so this allowed the, um, the uh, FDA, um, based on this therotyping, to expand the label. And you can see that there was a disproportionate impact on our Black and Hispanic patients, um, that more of them were eligible for the drug based on this label expansion than had been originally in the, uh, in the trials. But modulators are not the end all and be all. There are many patients who are not eligible um, for um, Trikafta in particular, or ETI, um, uh, within the CF registry. Um, and again, disproportionately affecting people of color, um, but these are patients who most of the time have stopped mutations for which modulators are not, um, will not work. So one thing that was pretty interesting um, that was uh, brought up in one of the plenaries was that um, we've had, um, unfortunately, an, an annual mortality rate that has been hovering um, right around 2% um, uh, for you know, the early part of the decade. Um, and then it started drifting down. And you can see when we actually got modulators, we started drifting down even further. Um, and so uh, about one and a half or 1%. Um, but really, in between 2019 and 2020, there was a substantial drop in CF mortality, um, which was interesting. And so uh, many are wondering, was this related to the approval um, and the subsequent prescription and usage of Trikafta? Was it related to social distancing and the fact that everyone was masking and people were not going out and being exposed to, um, to other viruses and bacteria? or probably some combination of both. And so it will be interesting to see where this um, tracks out um, as many places have reopened um, and people are not as vigilant about mask wearing now. So um, the PROMISE Longitudinal Observational Study um, is a study uh, that was started when Trikafta was approved in October of 2019. Um, and um, it is ongoing to this day. And now that Trikafta has been approved down to the age of six, they've actually extended it. And now they're looking at those patients who are six and above and, um, and monitoring in real world circumstances, how are people doing on this drug? Um, and so this is interim data that was presented in Symposium 4 and in various poster sessions. And so Steve Rowe at Alabama, Dave Nichols um, at, um, in, in uh, uh, Seattle Children's um, are the lead investigators who are um, uh, running this study. Um, and so this is a graph, um, excuse me, this is a graph looking at lung function. So down here on the x-axis, and these were the various visits. So visit one was the start day, the day that they, or the day before they started Tricaf. Visit two was 28 days later. Visit three was 90 days later, so three months, and then six months after starting. And over here, this is the FEV1 in percent predicted. And um, what we're looking at is actually the change in FEV1. So if everyone started out at their baseline, so there was zero change at the first day, where did they go afterwards? And so um, and they broke down this data uh, pretty interestingly by people who had never been on a modulator before, for people who had previously been on either Simdaco or, or Canby, and for people who had previously been on Ibocaftor. And so you can see the most benefit and the most sustained benefit was for people who had previously not had modulator therapy, which makes sense, right? Because the prior modulators also did improve lung function. But these people improved on average over the six months um, of 10.8% in their lung function. People who are transitioning from Orcambi or Simdaco um, onto a two drug modulator, uh, from the two drug modulator regimen into the three drug, um, they improved about 9.2%. 
and the people who went from um, Ivacaftor to um, to um, uh, ETI improved about 6.14%. Looking at sweat chloride, which um, you may remember is um, the way many um, folks are diagnosed. Um, again, they did a sweat chloride at baseline, so before they started the drug, right? So everyone's at zero, and this is looking at the change over time. A lower sweat chloride is um, less consistent with CF, um, and people drop dramatically between that in that first month of treatment. Their sweat chloride levels. Um, fell by almost 40 points um, in the no modulator or the two drug modulator um, groups and um, by 24 points in the Ivacaftor group. And this really, I think, um, reflects the fact that, um, you know, Ivacaftor was or and still is a highly effective modulator therapy for those genotypes that it's approved for. It is very effective. Um, the two drugs that we had before, the Simdaco and, um, and the Orcambi, were less effective. We have lots of data now that these drugs have been approved for several years now. And so we have lots of data showing that they do show decline in the rate of lung function loss. Um, but overall, they didn't have a really tremendous impact on the sweat chloride, suggesting that they weren't actually targeting that CFTR protein incredibly well. And then obviously people who had not been monomodulators before had, um, had no chance of having their, their sweat chloride affected. So they had a, a big drop as well. So this is a little busy um, uh, and I'm not gonna walk through all of this, but I thought it was interesting um, uh, to just touch on microbiology. Um, and so, uh, you know, every time folks come to clinic, we either do a throat swab or a sputum culture, uh, you know, we actually use that information to help us guide treatment plans. Um, and a lot of us have been curious about what happens to the sputum cultures um, when people start on a highly effective modulator therapy. And so this was a, um, this is from the, the um, Promise study as well. This is in a subgroup of 214 people, and they had a wide range of young lung function um, between, you know, as low as 29% up to 130% of their predicted, and they were um, in ages um, at 12 to 61. And so the red line over here represents the mean value at each of these months. So the, again, the starting point, the months on the therapy, and over here is how um, how much bacteria there was, what the density of the colonies were in their culture. And so um, this, the red line here is the mean of each of these individual points. And so for Staph aureus, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and for Stenotrophomonas multifilia, all fairly common pathogens in CF, um, we saw a drop off in how much bacteria was present in people's sputums um, all the way through. Most of the drop off occurred during that early phase, the first month of treatment, um, but it was sustained over the course of treatment. And they're going to be following longer term data um, to see if patients actually become infection free, um, where we can't culture any organisms anymore, or if they just um, uh, stay at lower levels. And so this was from a, um, a single center that looked at, a, uh, at the same um, type of analyses, looking at people before and after and how much um, their bacterial colonization was reduced. And they had very similar findings um, in uh, pseudomonas and staph and, um, and other um, uh, common CF pathogens. So very encouraging data. GI symptoms are also um, a, a pretty important thing to think about, um, and uh, a lot of this is really preliminary data. Um, but um, the people who are enrolled in the GI substudy of the PROMISE study um, uh, were given GI symptom questionnaires um, at, at the various time points where they came back for study visits. And um, they actually reported relatively small changes in their GI symptoms. Um, their, uh, you know, abdominal pain, constipation, bloating, diarrhea did not um, show much improvement over the course. The fecal elastase um, is a measurement that we use in order to diagnose someone as pancreatic sufficient or insufficient. And so um, a normal level is, um, is about 200. Um, if you're above 200, you're considered to have normal fecal elastase and thus normal pancreatic function. 
um, between um, or less than 100 is um, a severe uh, case of, um, of pancreatic insufficiency. And so most people who have two copies of the Delta F fall in this category. And then in between are some of the other um, uh, 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 genetics, um, uh, genetic mutations that fall um, in between the 100 to 200 category. And so this is a graph looking at a baseline and at six months. Um, and they measured people's fecal elastase um, in 99 subjects and found that it really didn't change um, over the course of, this, of the six months of the study. Um, and in fact, the people who were, fell in the normal range at baseline were still normal. The, there was only one in the mild to moderate range at baseline and that person actually fell into the severe range. Oops. And then the rest stayed severely in, in um, um, uh, insufficient. So um, certainly not what we hope for, although we're going to be tracking this out further. There was some evidence that intestinal inflammation may be decreased. They measured another fecal value called calpro calprotectin. And so um, even if the pancreatic sufficiency isn't restored, there may be additional GI benefits to be seen. So um, as I mentioned, um, Trikafta has now been approved for patients aged six to 11 years of age. And so um, this is um, data from the original phase three study um, where it was a 24 week study. Um, and this is the change in FEV1 again here. Patients started with zero change at baseline and then really the most dramatic improvement within two weeks of starting therapy, although they did actually continue to have an improvement um, over the 24 weeks that they were studied. And once again, the sweat chloride also fell um, and, uh, and reached actually the, um, uh, the level of 60 um, uh, by week 12 um, I, I, in the uh, in the study, so suggesting that um, that they actually would have been below the diagnostic range for CF um, had they been tested at that point in time. So, because this is um, the the promised day, uh, this was just approved in June of this year, and so these patients have been on it for less than six months. So, I don't have any any data from the um, from the actual promised longitudinal study for these patients just yet. So one thing that everyone's thinking about are novel CFTR approaches. I already mentioned that there's many people who are not qualified um, based on their mutations, um, they, or even people who can't tolerate it, that experience side effects. Um, and thus we need options other than these, um, these uh, CFTR modulators. And so this is data that was presented in lots of different places over the course of the, uh, of the um, conference, uh, most notably in the plenary symposium for and in the poster sessions. So um, uh, plenary two was just amazing. So I think that that one is actually available for everybody um, regardless of if you registered or not. Um, but they did a really great job of um, explaining genetic therapies um, to someone like me who doesn't have a background in it. Um, so we're gonna talk through this um, a little bit. Um, this is the path to the cure initiative. So if we start here, we know that all, one thing that all patients with CF have in common is a mutated CFTR gene. So what do we need to figure out? Well, we have three different approaches that we can take. We can either repair that CFTR protein, that, that product that's, um, that's uh, malformed. Um, and then the way we do that is through these modulator therapies that we've been talking about so far. So if it's not functioning, it's in the wrong place, we can provide a modulator that will repair it. We can actually also restore that CFTR protein. So we're not repairing it, we're actually giving them functional protein by various techniques. And the one that's furthest along here is this um, microRNA or short oligonucleotide therapy that we're gonna talk about in a second. And then finally, we can fix or replace the CFTR gene and that's called gene editing. So in that case, you're not, um, uh, targeting the protein, you're actually targeting the DNA that's making the faulty protein. Um, and, and so that would be the goal, the cure um, for CF, because these are these two, while effective, are short term, they um, need to be repeated. That's why people need to take Trikafta every day um, <coughs> or the other modulators. It doesn't last in their system. 
So going back to that, um, that uh, uh, pipeline that we were talking about, looking at the preclinical um, uh, drugs and trial and, um, and the different phases of treatment. Um, this, um, the one that's kind of furthest along now is this uh, VX121 plus T's captor plus VX561. Um, and yes, they are incredibly complicated names. Um, so this is a study that's actually starting soon. Um, this is a combination, much like Trikafta, and this is by, made by the same um, company that's making Trikafta. Um, it's going to give us two um, corrector um, uh, drugs combined with what they call deuterated ivacaftor. Um, so basically what they did was they adjusted the ivacaftor mo uh, molecule just a little bit to make it last for a full 24 hours. And so and then this um, is replacing the alexacaftor component of the trikafta. Um, and they had some, uh, some nice early studies that showed um, that this, um, this particular molecule may even provide additional benefit beyond what alexacaftor is able to do. So the combination of these three drugs is about to start in a phase three clinical trial. A different company, um, AbV2222, um, is a new corrector drug from a, a, a different company, um, and they have um, their drug through phase two now, where they were able to show a reduction in sweat chloride. That was impressive, although that very short trial didn't have a change in FEV1, which we would certainly like to see. Um, and so what they're working on now is adding in this potentiator so that they can more closely mimic this, um, this dual or triple drug therapy um, that um, is undergoing safety studies right now. And then afterwards, they will be added together and see whether or not the combination of those two can reduce the sweat chloride and improve lung function. And then finally, um, the, um, uh, the ELOX-02 is a new corrector. Um, and this one's particularly interesting because this one is designed to, um, uh, a new corrector to override a premature stop signal. So you may remember that I um, said earlier on that the, um, the patients with a stop mutation, and those are the ones that typically have an X at the end of the name, those patients are um, not eligible for, mod for the modulator therapy that we currently have available. And the reason is this, is that when, you're, um, when you're, your cells are actually making these proteins, um, this is the, uh, the example of the protein that's running through the cell. This is the DNA that's going through that's telling the cell what kind of protein to make. And so the cell is going through and it's reading this protein. And then all of a sudden it comes here and this is a premature stop codon. So it tells the um, cell stop here and the cell doesn't know any better. So it just stops. And then it ends up making a small short protein that is not able to be fixed by our current modulators. And so what this drug is, um, is hoping to do um, when it gets into later phase trials is actually tell the cell to ignore this premature stop codon and allow the cell to continue translating the entire protein, even though there's a stop signal in it. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, that, um, uh, uh, this VX121 component. The, um, this was a press release um, that Vertex put out um, uh, in July um, uh, regarding the early phase of this program. So this was a, a, a four-week trial, um, and they had everybody on Syndico, T-Ziva, um, initially, and then they put people either um, on this active control of T-Ziva or this combination of the 121, the uh, T-Zacafter, uh, and the 561, which is that, that deuterated or, or changed ivacaftor one that's the once a day dosing. And so comparing these two, they had um, some nice improvements in FEV1 and sweat chloride. They did not compare this um, directly against trikafta, although I imagine that will be something that they will be looking to do in the future. Um, but certainly the benefit would be a once a day drug is always going to be easier than a twice a day drug. So we talked a little bit about therotyping before, um, and therotyping, again, is really matching the therapeutics to, um, to a genotype, providing personalized medicine for a patient. And so there's lots of really creative ways that people are doing this now. Um, uh, the, uh, the major way that we're looking at this is through something, something called organoid, or pardon me, organoids. 
Um, so uh, providers will take a scraping of a cell, cells from the inside of the nose um, or a biopsy of rectal tissue. And under certain laboratory conditions, they are able to actually grow these cells into a, a complex that really functions almost as if the, it was the respiratory epithelium um, or the rectal epithelium like it was um, in the person. And then they can use these cells in order to, um, to target um, or test the various different approved modulators and see for this individual with these mutations, what is the best therapy available? And so um, there's uh, the CF um, lab um, and there's uh, two other sites around the country um, that are doing this on a routine basis. And so for some folks who have more rare mutations that were not included in the clinical trials to get approved for, um, for any of the modulator therapies, this is a way to um, provide therapy to them based on their combination of mutations. So again, going back to this, um, uh, this um, path to a cure initiative. So we've talked about repairing um, the CFTR protein, um, but we really, um, uh, so um, we're gonna talk about restoring the CFTR protein and then fixing or replacing the CFTR gene next. So um, in order to, um, and again, I stole this shamelessly from the plenary too, um, but I thought it was really, really, really well done. Um, and um, uh, certainly even um, those of us with a medical background need a refresher about um, how these genetics uh, work. So the CFTR protein um, is encoded in a gene. And genes are comprised of areas called exons and introns. Okay, and for simplicity here, they have them just alternating. The DNA um, or the gene is the permanent thing that exists in the cell that is the, the map for all the other proteins that are being made in the cell. Um, and so what happens when the, um, when the, uh, when the uh, protein goes to be made is that first they make a copy of this DNA and that's called RNA. And you can see it has the same exon, intron, exon, intron. Um, but now this is, um, I like to think of it as like, um, I, you know, if you've, if you've photocopied a, um, a, a form, right, and you keep the original um, in, its, uh, in its special sleeve, right, because you don't want um, to ever lose the last copy of it, right? So yeah, you keep that one protected. That's sort of like the DNA, right? All the copies are made from that. The RNA, you can do a lot of stuff with it, right? You can throw it out, give it to other people, um, but you can always go back and make more copies of the DNA. So that's what this RNA is before splicing. But then it's not done. Um, the, then in order to um, turn into a messenger RNA, it actually cuts portions of this, um, this RNA and pulls these other exons together. And that is what gets translated into the CFTR protein. So this is really important in understanding how we can actually target the, um, the genetics. And my slide is not advancing. Does anyone want to unmute while I try to get this working again? Ooh. Hello. Are you guys still able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you see my screen still? It's, it went dark, so we can uh -huh. see. The, I can see the slides off to the left, but then the, the center is dark. That's strange. All right, let me um, let me stop sharing and then try to pull it back up. Does anyone want to ask a question while I'm trying to figure out why it just crashed? No. All right. Let me. Um, <laughs> oh, just in not, for that. Okay. Go ahead. Take that. I told you. I warned you about the kids, right? 
Try again. All right, are we back in business? Looks like it. All right, good. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be a Zoom conference without- Hey guys, please, thank you. Wouldn't be a Zoom conference without um, some kind of technical mal uh, misfunction, right? Okay. So um, this analogy was great to me um, in thinking about how these different genetic technologies are gonna work. Um, they used a car as an analogy for CFTR and said, all right, if the car is the CFTR protein, then if you have car problems, that is your CFTR mutations, right? So just like CFTR, a car can have lots of different reasons why it's not gonna go. Your steering wheel could get locked or be missing, right? Your transmission could be broken. You could have no gas in the car. Um, you can have tires missing. All those things will ultimately result in the end problem of car not working. And so the way um, we target genetic therapies for CF, um, there's a couple of different mechanisms. So the one that is the furthest along um, um, in this pipeline is using something called mRNA, which has been really um, highlighted in the, in the um, press recently because it is a similar um, type of, uh, of techniques that, are, that were used for the, um, creating the COVID um, vaccine. And so in mRNA, Basically, what we're saying is your car doesn't worth, we're going to give you a rental. And so rather than trying to fix your car, um, we're just going to give everybody a rental, right? But you got to keep using the rental if you want to keep going in the car. Gene therapy, um, on the other hand, um, would say, okay, um, your car doesn't work. We're going to give you a new car. Okay, and this car is yours, and we're going to keep using it throughout your entire lifespan, right? You don't have to turn back in the rental car, um, but we're actually going to go in there um, and um, and fix your um, your uh, your genetic message, and then find. Uh, I'm sorry, not fix. Um, we're just going to replace it. We're going to replace the genetic message with a new genetic message, and you're going to have a brand new car. In gene editing. Um, it, there's the scenario where they're saying, okay, well, we're going to try to fix your car to get it to move again, right? And the challenge with gene editing is that, like we said, there's many reasons why the car isn't going to go. Is your problem the steering wheel? Is your problem the tires? Is your problem the transmission? And so there have to be specific gene editing um, uh, 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 approaches for each of these different mutations. And so this is... Um, certainly trickier um, to try to be able to target all these various things, but there's been some really creative new techniques um, uh, that um, are very early on in the, in the process that we think that we can actually achieve all these different areas. All right, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about COVID. Um, I'm gonna talk about the CDC, or this is information from the CDC as well as from the CF Foundation. Um, the foundation has been tracking COVID cases um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it, uh, in the Port CF, um, we report um, all of our cases of COVID-19, and then on a weekly basis, they actually email us and tell us um, how our community is doing. And so we have the total cumulative number of cases over the past um, over the past two years, and then we have the changes that we've seen since the last time they generated this report. And so you can see here, uh, this is last week's report. Um, you can see here they've started tracking vaccinations as well. So the number of people who have been vaccinated um, in the 5 to 11 group, the 12 to 16 group, and then all vaccinations since those vaccines were available at different times for different people. So let's talk about vaccines. Um, so vaccine boosters are now recommended for all people age 18 and older. You can get a, a booster either six months after your original two dose shot, if you got the Pfizer or Moderna shot, and two months after you got the, uh, the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The interesting thing is that it does not need to be the same type as your original vaccination. You will get the same benefit with a booster, um, even if you got Pfizer before and you're getting Moderna now. And people have um, been asking, can I get it the same day as my flu shot? Yes, you can. It's up to you. You don't have to, for sure, um, but it is absolutely safe and effective to be given on the same day as the flu shot. 
Um, vaccines, as I said before, are now approved for people above age five. This was on October 29th um, that it got approved um, to be given to children age five and older. Um, it's two doses um, at 21 days apart. Um, and this is a picture of, uh, of my six-year-old Matthew on the day he got his first shot. You can see we came right from his Taekwondo class um, into our, our uh, CVS. And uh, he's showing off his little um, uh, arm there with his Band-Aid. And so that was a really exciting um, day for all of us, even though he does look a little tearful, but that was the, that was the injection. <laughs> Um, so where can you get vaccines? Um, they're a lot more widely available than they were when they first came out. Um, if you go on vaccines.gov, you get a lot of information. Um, a lot of local health departments are, um, are administering them. Um, some schools, health systems, um, doctor's offices are also um, administering them. And then this is really cool, um, built within this vaccine.gov, if you text your zip code to this number, they will actually, um, you'll get a text back with several options for local things to you. Um, and so they'll say, oh, you know, it's available here at the CVS and it's available here at the Walgreens and available here at your health department. And they'll give you the address, the phone numbers of the places. And they'll also tell you whether or not they have the, um, the uh, you know, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson Johnson, or um, if they have the kids vaccine available, because it is a reduced dose for the kids compared to the adult vaccine. And so if you do have an interest in getting um, your booster as the same um, type of shot that you got before, um, you can easily find that out. Um, I, uh, what I think is also really cool is that um, through, um, through Lyft and Uber, you can actually get free rides to your vaccine appointments. And so if that's an issue, um, that's built into the same system. If you text your zip code and um, it will actually include links where you can you know, say, okay, I want to schedule. And then I'll say, do you need assistance getting to this appointment? And if you click on yes, you can get a free Uber ride to go to um, get your shot. Um, just some uh, general advice for the holidays, and um, we did send this out to our, our adult crew. Um, um, uh, this comes from, um, uh, uh, from the foundation, from those of us in, in our CF center. Um, ideally, you ensure that all eligible people are fully vaccinated before traveling. That's the best way to prevent the spread of COVID, especially now with new variants again coming out. If you're going to be indoors in a public place, wear a mask still, even if you are vaccinated, we do know that vaccinated people can still get and transmit COVID. Ideally, avoid crowded places. Um, and so even outdoor events are not necessarily safe if the people are packed in together. And you can consider taking a home COVID test before you travel. Um, these are widely available now in pharmacies. They cost um, uh, somewhere in the order of $15, $25, but um, President Biden just um, announced a program that's starting in January. Um, insurances are going to be required to reimburse for the cost of home COVID tests. Um, and if you don't have insurance, there's actually free testing kits that will be sort of stockpiled and stationed at various locations that you can go pick up a test, bring it home, and, um, and test before you go um, so that you know you're not bringing um, uh, an asymptomatic infection to your loved one. Um, the check the one that you get before you uh, you you decide when you're going to test because um, most of them produce results in less than two days. Some are as quick as 15 minutes, and so it varies by the test, but they're fairly accurate, and so that would be a good way of knowing um, to just do a little risk assessment before you travel. All right, useful resources. How am I doing on time? Great. Okay, so. Um, CFF.org um, is the website for, um, for the CF Foundation. And so I'm going to try to um, pause my sharing here. Um, and I'm going to switch over to show you another screen. Let's do this. You guys all seeing the CF website now? Thumbs up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
<laughs> um, all right, so the CF website um, I, I has a wealth of information. As you probably know, I'm going to show you one thing that I really find helpful. Um, if you click on research and clinical trials, um, and you can actually access that drug development pipeline that I was um, uh, referring to. Um, but you can also And just went blank again. Oh my goodness. You can also find a clinical trial. So this is a really cool feature that the foundation um, instituted a couple of years ago. And I am getting error messages from my um, Chrome extension. Okay, I'm just going to talk you through it because apparently my internet doesn't want to work. Um, So um, on there, there's something called a clinical trials finder. And so you can actually search by type of study that you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in study on pancreatic enzymes or nutrition or genetic therapies or mental health, um, you can search by the type of study and, um, uh, and um, also some limited eligibility criteria. And it will show you information about all the studies that are sponsored um, or endorsed by the CF Foundation and contact information for the folks running those trials at the various sites. So you're not limited to participating at the site that you get your care at, which I think is incredibly important. The next thing um, that I'm gonna not be able to show, I guess, um, is the, um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. This is a, uh, a government endorsed website and it's actually a requirement um, uh, to register your study on clinicaltrials.gov if you are doing an interventional study. Um, and so every interventional study, um, a, a drug study, therapeutic study, um, a, a genetic study, not just within CF is listed on this, um, this uh, website. And I really wish that um, my thing didn't keep crashing so I could show you it, but clinicaltrials.gov, you go in and you could type something as generic as um, cystic fibrosis and um, you know uh, x-rays, and it will pull up all the studies that are have ever been registered in clinicaltrials.gov. And you can filter it by those that are actively enrolling, those that are close to enrollment, um, uh, those that are um, have results available because um, the investigators are also obligated to report results on this particular website. And, um, uh, and uh, it is a really useful tool to get a concept of what's going on outside the, um, the CF community, um, uh, but maybe of interest to you in other areas of research. All right. And my last thing, luckily, this was my, the last portion of my, um, of my talk because now PowerPoint is, um, is not behaving, um, was talking about community voice. So community voice is uh, community Voice is the patient's way to engage with the CF Foundation. Um, through Community Voice, um, uh, you can decide what you want to be contacted about and when and, um, and uh, offer your opinions. And so people um, with CF, so about half of the people who are engaged in Community Voice are people with CF and half are um, are maybe a little less than half our parents and then um, a smattering of other people who have some either interest or relative with CF um, or some other reason to, um, to want to participate in this group. So it doesn't just have to be the patient um, or a first degree family member. So grandparents, whatever, you can get on community voice um, and um, indicate what your particular interests are, what you wanna learn more about. And then you'll become part of the community that is polled when we're trying to decide what the next 
directions of the foundation are. What do you want to see studied? What's important to you? Um, and this is actually critically important for those of us who do clinical research um, because the CF Foundation takes that information and says, well, gosh, you know, like there's a really high interest in doing studies in sinus disease, for example, in, um, in people with CF. And that may not be a particular, you know, exciting area unless you're an ENT doc or unless you're somebody who's really got bad sinus sinus disease, right? And so, um, and so if the CF Foundation sees that that's a really big interest among the people who are um, uh, uh, discussing this within Community Voice, then they will target a particular um, grant application and say, hey, our community really wants to hear, really wants to know about you know, CF sinus disease. Here's a, a grant that you can apply for where, you know, you can answer some of these questions that are being raised by our community. And so one of the things that I did I want to highlight, and I had some percentages and I'm not going to be able to remember them here without my, um, my PowerPoint pulled up, but um, people um, uh, underrepresented in minorities are really underrepresented in, uh, underrepresented in community voice. Um, and so highly encourage people who, um, who identify not as, um, as cisgender or um, people who identify as a person of color um, to make your voice heard. Um, and let the community know what you are interested in learning about. Um, and so I think, I'm pretty sure that was the end of my PowerPoint. Um, and so I apologize for all the, uh, the technical and the um, children interruptions, um, but happy to, it looks like we're a fairly small, small number so people can unmute as wanted as you want and, um, and feel free to share any thoughts. I'm going to click on the chat here. Oh, Hi, thank you, Dr. Mahavanali is uh, was on the session, um, and uh, uh, great to hear from him. Jennifer, can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, this is Mike Brock. Um, Hi, I was, Mike. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, the people with CF slide, you know, it listed all the people who had CF who received who got COVID over the past whatever year and a half. Um, just it listed the number of deaths. I don't know. I wrote, tried to write it down. It was either 28 or 48. Was that low? Was that high? Was that normal? Um, I believe it was actually 18, um, uh, 18 people over the, the two years. And so proportionally, we have not seen a, you know, if you, if you, um, actually look at the total population of the US and how many deaths that we've had, which is in the hundred thousands, um, hundreds of thousands, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, we have not seen a proportional increase. They're not, CF doesn't seem to be more likely to be affected. In fact, very early on in the pandemic, we had no deaths um, related, uh, no deaths in CF patients. Um, and we think a lot of that had to do with the fact that people were already so accustomed to doing the hand washing and the masking and the social distancing and staying away from people who had colds and things like that. Um, and so that was not a, a hard thing for them to incorporate into their lives. Um, and so it actually took several, several months before um, I, we had um, our first death in a CF patient. The vast majority of those um, of those 18 deaths have been in people with advanced lung disease. Um, so an FEV1 less than 35%, and in several cases, transplanted patients. Um, and so that would also mirror what um, what was you know the highest risk patients um, uh, within the pandemic overall. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Hi, this is Timothy. I had a question. Um, I remember uh, last year there was some discussion about um, phage therapy. Did that come up at all during the conference? It did. It did. Phage therapy is really interesting. It's really cool. Um, for those of you that don't know, phage, P-H-A-G-E is how you spell it. Phage is short for bacterial phage. Bacterial phages are naturally occurring organisms that are super tiny and actually target bacteria, specifically target bacteria. Um, 
And um, so they're not antibiotics, but they're actually um, sort of, if you want to think about it as a, a virus for the bacteria, right? Something that's going to target that bacteria. Um, they they isolate phages actually from human waste, right? So what's in our GI tract. Um, and so it can be a, and no pun intended, quite a, a, you know, a messy process of actually isolating out these phages. Um, but we have several companies um, and institutions that are building what they're calling libraries of phages. So basically they're trying to identify phages that um, that targets specific types of pseudomonas or mycobacterium or staph. And so they've been growing and building these, um, these, uh, these targeted phages. And, and the goal is, is that if you have a patient who has really highly resistant bacteria, um, where they uh, they can't be treated with the typical doses of a uh, of your your normal antibiotics, or they don't tolerate those doses. Um, administering phage to them, and there's a, a different companies working on different angles. There's some that are um, targeting it via inhalation, and there's some that are doing um, injection forms. Um, but if you administer these phages in one of these manners, then you can um, uh, you can actually give the patient something that is not going to harm them, but it will actually only harm their bacteria and that specific bacteria, right? Um, and so um, it, uh, all the studies are like incredibly early, early going on. In fact, I think that the furthest one um, is from a company called Armada. Um, and um, they, I believe, are just now in the first, um, you know, maybe month of their, um, of their phage study. Uh, but don't quote me on that because uh, I'm not entirely sure. But, um, but it is something that we're definitely still interested and in looking at and um, hoping to get some more data as, uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your attention. I appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday and uh, or had a wonderful holiday if you uh, uh, already celebrated and um, uh, look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so thank much you so for much. speaking. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Sebastian. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good night. You. Good night. Bye, thank you.